All right, Stuart McLean, I want to tell you a story. Best-selling author, broadcaster, journalist, and above all, storyteller. A guy who believes that the tiniest moments often contain the biggest truths. So what do you guys do? What's this all about? I work in a cemetery. <laughs> For almost 20 years, Stuart has hosted The Vinyl Cafe on CBC Radio 1. The show revolves around Stuart's fictional family, Dave, Morley, Sam, and Stephanie. Characters that have become very real for millions of fans. Mor Morley stared at him and, and he said, it's okay, I haven't brushed my teeth yet. <laughs> for Stuart, the Vinyl Cafe is a way to make sense of the world, a place free of cynicism and negativity. He's not naive, Stuart. He did start as a journalist. I'm Stuart McLean in Toronto. Also working with the legendary CBC broadcaster Peter Zowski. Yet along the way, he made the conscious decision to switch to fiction, as he does in his new book. A collection of cautionary tales about fear is called Revenge of the Vinyl Cafe. Please welcome to the show, Stuart McLean. Oh, nice. Thank you for having me. Oh, you me a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, man. Thank you. Nice to see you. It's nice to be here. This is uh, wonderful as they all are, but I like this one, this new book, because the central theme of fear, you know, it, it just kind of ever-present. Is it always a motivator for you, often a motivator for you? I'll tell you a story. I, but, um, my, uh... It's the best part, right here. <laughs> so I, I uh, did a big show at Place des Arts years ago. The first time I went back to Montreal with the Vinyl Cafe. Sold out, end of the show. Uh, they all stand up, standing ovation. My mother and father are in the uh, second or third row. Somebody goes up to my mother at the end of the show and says, you must be very proud of him. And she said, well, more surprised, really. <laughs> and, and then she said, we really didn't expect him to amount to very much. So, and it was a reasonable thing for her to have uh, a judge. I mean, I didn't really expect myself to amount to very much either. So. I was, uh, I was intimidated by the brains and the athletes all around me and uh, just didn't think I measured up. You've seen so much of this country and told so many stories about who we are. And mm -hmm. the, we often hear how diverse it is, and I get that. Where, where is the sameness in this country? The sameness is our belief in the collective, which is our sense of ourselves and how we pull together for the greater good. And you can see it in, you can see it in the way that we, in, in the way that we have solved the difficult problems of living together. How do we look after those who might harm themselves or who might harm us? How do we look after those of us who are sick? How do we look after those of us who are out of work or can't work? We come together and we together uh, have come up with solutions that when you look at the w solutions that other countries have around the world mm -hmm. that ours stand up with the best of them. Let's go back and play this clip. This is kind of a one of these crucial moments in Canadian history, this, this sort of era. If we allow Canadian values and Canadian identity to be destroyed by the less attractive aspects of American life and culture, that will be because we didn't care enough to do anything effective about it in Canada. Or even perhaps, and I don't like to think this, because we wanted it that way. Lester Pearson, yeah. Prime Minister, when I was in my formative years, and I had no idea you were going to play that clip. That is so funny because I was walking down here today and I was thinking to myself, if he asks me who my heroes are, who am I going to say? Yeah. And I thought, I'll say E.B. White, yeah. the great... Charles Webb. Char the great ch child writer from uh, uh, America, but who also wrote all the essays in The New Yorker. And then I thought Lester Pearson, yeah. who, uh, who, was, uh, who won the Nobel Peace Prize for Canada uh, for his work, and who started when, when the first uh, United Nations peacekeeping force in response to the Suez Crisis. So much happened there that it has so much of our identity. It's great stories can be very grand. One of the things you do so beautifully is you tell these wonderful stories. In this one, we've made the conscious choice here you have to age this family. Slowly, yes. but they age. Kind of the way I'd like to age. <laughs> <laughs> They're getting an extra two or, they get two or three years for every one of ours. That's, which is nice, which is nice. Yeah. 
But if you age them, does that mean they have to die? Well, yeah, and uh, that's hard. Uh, I, um, Dude, you killed the dog. I, yeah, well, I, yeah, I did kill the dog. <laughs> that is super heavy, man. <laughs> well, it's also cowardly, right? In easier, a way, it is cowardly. <laughs> easier to kill the dog than to kill Sam yeah, or David or whatever. Or Morley. Yeah, right? well, that would be too much to handle. Well, we'll have to handle it sometime, right? Will we? Well, either that or me. We're going to lose somebody. <laughs> Listen, pal, are you going to take a hit for the team or not? What are we going to do? <laughs> so, yeah, so the, just even... And, and I wondered in this context, are you close to these characters truly? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, that's what keeps me writing, actually. After, I, I've been writing about them now for 19 years. Yes. That's a long time. And I, you would think you would get bored of it. And if I got bored, I would stop. Uh, because... It would be awful to, to work at something that you hated, that you were bored of. What keeps me writing is I want to know what happens to them. I want to know their story. And that's it. You could say, well, just make it up and go to the beach, right? right? But I can't make it up because if I make it up and say, well, Sam becomes a prime minister and uh, changes the country and Stephanie does whatever, um, I can wake up, the unless I write it and say it is so, it, I could wake up the next morning and say, no, nah, he didn't become prime minister. Sam's your window into boyhood? Yeah. Yeah. The boyhood you wanted? I don't know. It's a window. You know, I don't know. I can't answer that. I'm not unhappy with my boyhood. And he, you know what? No, it's not, because he doesn't have the boyhood that I didn't have. Right. You know, if he gets, if he gets, uh, if he gets too old, somebody else will have a kid. I'll write about that. <laughs> well, listen, you, 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 in a weird way, almost inherited a kid in a bizarre way. Look at this. Now, I, if I was a mother and I'd given my kid to a stranger and we came, I'd be okay about this until we came to a station. And I'd be thinking if we came to a station, he could get off now. Of course, she could get off now, leave me with a kid which is something that <laughs> I hadn't really thought of when I took it. I mean, you read about this sort of stuff in the paper, right? So that's from the National, right? Yeah. This, it's back in like 1997, I think. We right? did four or five bits on the National with Stuart Cox, who's producer of the, uh, um, the, the Dragon's Den. Yeah. Or the, uh, we did these four or five bits where I set up... Um, in a, th that one was on the train from Montreal to Halifax. We also did a hops, hospital cafeteria, a uh, fall fair, and the ferry from um, uh, Vancouver to Nanaimo. And what we did is I sat there with a table and a sign which said interviews, five cents. And whoever wanted to come and be interviewed would sit down. <laughs> in that clip, I was interviewing a lady who had a baby, and then she said, I'm, I'm just going to go to the cafeteria. Is that OK? I said, yeah, I'll hold your kid. And then I was left holding her kid as she went to the guy. And I was musing on what would happen if she wouldn't come back. They were amazing pieces. But I would as, love to see those pieces but again. as you said, that's a whole other level of trust. When a stranger says, I'll be right back. Yeah, but I was, I was on camera at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen, to this era, camera doesn't mean a good thing, right? So. You know, when I was a kid, my mother uh, used to put me out in the front yard in a playpen. And they, she said she used to put the playpen. She'd be in, she wasn't watching it. I'd be out there for hours in the front yard. And she said she put the playpen as close to the sidewalk as possible where the strangers were walking by. So if I threw a toy out of the playpen, they would pick it up and put it back in for me. <laughs> so that's why. Uh, your, your mother's pretty rad, yeah. man. <laughs> Stick around more with Stuart McLean after this. All right, coming up. The moment Stuart thought just might have ended his career. That's go. the most disgusting thing you've ever done. <laughs> oh, Peter. Then. Come on. Let's get physical. From the Air Force, Alan Park checks in with our Three Things panel. We're talking about originality and what makes a good story. For me, the less description, the better. I guess my perfect story would be uh, stuff that happens to a person. Isn't he beautiful, Peter? <laughs> a, a Madagascar hissing cockroach. Now, the cage was extra. Very, now, come up, give me now. Very low maintenance, just a little bit of lettuce once a day. You get, just take it out. It looks like a beetle, or like a cigar, the end of a cigar. 
And, uh, oh, here. I don't want to. <laughs> Say hi there. Does he hiss? Does he? he he's, it's just a juvenile. He doesn't hiss. Does he, he, mean he doesn't hiss yet? Yet, he will. And when? Uh, he's going up my arm. <laughs> that was Stuart McLean. So, for, for those who've come to Stuart later on, we, we know the stuff that he does now, but of course, for, for, for many, their initial connection with you on radio was with Peter Zosky. Yeah. That's your retirement gift to Zosky. <laughs> that was a film, that was Zosky's last show, filmed in Medicine Hat, Saskatchewan. I had no idea that was filmed. I've never seen that. He, I, I had given him in a, in a, I used to go on a show once a week and tell a story, and in a famous episode uh, years before that clip we just saw, I presented uh, a cricket. 15-cent cricket, which I, I bought for him as a pet. And he was a heavy smoker, and he, uh, uh, he blew smoke into the cricket jar. And I called him out on it. I said, don't blow smoke on my cricket. And he <laughs> said, it's an insipid critic. And he got a, his words mixed up. And we started to giggle. And we, and we just lost it. Like, we, we were live on national radio. We, we ended up hysterically lying on the floor, kicking our legs in the air. <laughs> and I thought, you know, it was very funny, but we were live on the radio, and you, do, you, know, we do, you don't do that in a serious piece. Right. And I, I laughed, thinking, well, that's my career. And, uh, and then the mail started coming in, and everybody wrote in across the country that they had all, people were driving off the road and laughing hysterically <laughs> along with it. So when Zosky was retiring, I thought it was appropriate to give him a cricket. Uh, but I couldn't find one in, in, in uh, a medicine hat, so I found a a cockroach and gave that to him instead. Not just any cockroach, but a hissing cockroach. Madagascar hissing cockroach. Undoubtedly telling stories through it its hisses. the best I could do. What a real pleasure. So great to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Stuart McLean, everybody. The book, Revenge of the Vinyl Cafe, and of course, the Vinyl Cafe on Radio 1 and Radio 2. We'll be right back.